to be disciplined is to take her out of her feminine flow. And so I think there's almost like a passivity that comes with that. It doesn't really lend itself well to like what we're actually talking about, but I think that it's more of like the wounded feminine that doesn't want to be subject to rules. And I mean, it's definitely been suppressed over many generations. So I think that there's, there's a part that's like almost in rebellion to the masculine. Part of the masculine is rules and structure and hierarchy. And those things are not bad, but if they're not in balance with the feminine, then they become oppressive. What up, Brett, Jaylene, Sarah? So good to see your guys, your you ladies, your faces sitting here with all ladies today on this one. You know, typically I don't do podcasts with more than one guest, let alone three guests. So we're going to find a way to make this work and not talk over each other. But I'm so excited you guys are here to talk about the recent Fit for Service Summit in Austin, Texas, all about the divine masculine. How is everyone feeling? Feeling great. Feeling great. Cool. So let's uh, just give a little bit of a background. Fit for service. If you're new to my podcast, then you might not have heard me talk about it before, but I do tend to talk about this a lot. And Aubrey Marcus, the founder of On It, a supplement company, a serial entrepreneur, New York Times bestselling author, just absolute content creator and genius uh, man, started a mastermind fellowship called fit for service in 2019 and i've been a part of it since january of 2020 and it's all about really soul development i like to say as opposed to personal development and a lot of spiritual work too and it's just been an incredible container where we have these summits three times a year and online programming and constantly meeting new people and just um, building each other up to do great work in the world that actually makes the world a better place, like the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible, which is something we'll, I'm sure we'll be talking about. So with that, that's how the, the four of us know each other. In addition to that, what's really cool is this past trimester, the whole content has been around the divine masculine. And I think that is a good place to start because at least for me, you know, I'd say the topic of feminine and masculine and divine masculine, toxic masculine and all this different stuff is new to me in the past couple of years, you know, and a lot of people might be hearing this for the first time and thinking like male, female and body parts and things like that, but it's much more woo than that. Um, do any of you feel called to uh, go in on what divine masculine means to you? I'll go. When I'm thinking about the divine masculine, I think about the archetypes of the feminine and the masculine and what they mean in relation to each other. And so starting with the divine feminine, which is actually where this year started, the divine feminine is uh, flow, intuition, uh, chaos and destruction, but also creation and really being in that state of surrender to whatever is coming up in the moment. Whereas in, in opposition to that, although they, they do work together, it's the divine masculine is more of like this discipline, focus, action oriented versus surrender oriented. Um, so it's the part of us that takes what we have heard or what we know through intuition and puts it out into the world through action. And that's really where I've been in my personal exploration of this topic is taking kind of the whispers of, of the universe and of life, and then putting them out into the world through disciplined and focused action. Beautifully said. Brett, Jaylene, do you, uh, either of you have anything you might want to add? Yeah, I'll just add a quick um, thing that was like, unique for me to start thinking about. I think normally in the world, we think of like the masculine being the leader and the feminine being the follower. And this whole year in Fit for Service is, has kind of flipped that script to say that like the feminine 
is that intuition, is that sort of spirit guide, is sort of like nature and the universe coming into the void and creating those ideas and that creation. And so that happens first. You listen to the call and then the masculine is the following and comes in to take action on the lessons and the downloads that that it was given. So it was just a big kind of switch than what we typically hear about the masculine kind of being the leader and the feminine following. Absolutely. And one thing that comes up for me is I was listening to Joe Rogan pox, uh, podcast recently, and um, he was talking about how he, I, I'm paraphrasing, but I think he was saying like, he's sick of hearing about the toxic masculine. And I, I don't think either my interpretation of what he was saying was completely accurate or what he was talking about toxic masculine is what we're talking about here and that's something i want to address because there could be a toxic masculine of say like trump for example if you're anti-trump or something that's a perfect example in terms of being like a misogynist right like whether whatever your political beliefs are you can be pro-trump but you can't really deny that the guy is a misogynist right or narcissist having said that like, yes, that could be toxic masculine, but in the way I look at toxic masculine is the way that what most led me to spirituality was being in my masculine of driving and doing and crossing off goals and constantly looking for that dopamine hit of success. And now two and a half years later, realizing that workaholic is not a joke, it's actual addiction and that you're chasing success for that present moment of the dopamine hit. And once that goes, all we ever have is that present moment. So then you get caught in this self-perpetuating negative feedback loop of chasing and goals and success and everything, which was the toxic masculine. And through sitting in the feminine the past year and a half, which when I say saying the feminine to what you ladies have just said, being more in flow, intuition and listening. And this is why I talk about soul life balance as opposed to work life balance, because, you know, that really helps to not just be in that driver and toxic of just like being in a, a human doing versus a human being, right? I have a thought that's just coming up. Like I wasn't at the Costa Rica summit, so I didn't get to explore the feminine as much as you all, but in the way that we hear the words toxic, toxic masculine all the time, what's the female counter or the feminine counterpart to that? Is there a toxic feminine? And was that discussed at all? It's not discussed, but what comes up for me is more of like the wounded feminine. The, the part of the feminine that doesn't want to be disciplined because to be disciplined is to take her out of her feminine flow. And so I think there's almost like a passivity that comes with that where the, the I wouldn't call it like a toxic, I, I, I don't even like the phrase toxic masculine. I think it doesn't really lend itself well to like what we're actually talking about, but I think that it's more of like the wounded feminine that doesn't want to be subject to rules and has been perhaps suppressed. And I mean, it's definitely been suppressed over many generations. So I think that there's, there's a part that's like almost in rebellion to the masculine, because I think another thing that came up for me as Jaylene was speaking is part of the masculine is rules and structure and hierarchy. And those things are not bad, but if they're not in balance with the feminine, then they become oppressive. So I have a question, for, mostly for you, Sarah, but for anyone here, but anyone that knows Sarah Howitt knows that she is very outspoken on uh, what's going on in the world today and uh, certain agendas. So in terms of hierarchy and like, you know, putting structure, government, whatever it would be, the way that our society is going with, say, you know, COVID vaccine um, passports and things like that, would you call that like a toxic or a wounded or a shadow masculine? Would that be accurate, would you say? It's a great question. I've never thought of what's going on in the world as that, but it seems to be that there is a component of structure and order and rules that have kind of run amok right? Like they've kind of um, taken over the collective where we feel like we want others to comply. And that is very much a part of the masculine. And I think what we're seeing in the collective is there's this 
rise of the divine feminine, which we could talk forever about that and kind of the history of that. But there's now this rise of the divine feminine, which is manifesting in the collective as this complete destruction and chaos that is happening in the world. And it's fighting against these rules and order and structure and hierarchy that have been in place for thousands of years. And so that's why we're seeing this clash right now is that there's these two elements that are not in the light, they're more in the shadow and they're, they're fighting each other. They're coming up against each other. Well said. Yeah, I just want to add a little bit to that is like, I think it's, it's not just like that it's rules and structure, but it's this control. It's like, I have to control you. And like, I have a really, I have a lot that I could speak on just how, how the world is responding to COVID is, you know, I work in regenerative agriculture. It's very indicative to how we have been in agriculture, where it's just this mindset of control everything and not an appreciation for how like the system works as a whole it's like oh I'm just gonna hone in and like control this one thing and if I can do that then everything then the chaos will stop but chaos is part of life it is being alive is chaotic so yeah I think it's not just having a little bit of structure it's like it's like I need to control you yeah it's also a suppression of creativity right because that the creativity is the feminine and I think we're seeing that in a lot of like the censorship that's going on it's like it's really taking the individual from from an individual from a creative creature and trying to like distill this person down into somebody that's just like a rule follower and is just like a reflection of the one that is doing the controlling. So I think that's a big element as well as the suppression of the creative, which is the feminine. This is such an awesome discussion. And Jaylene, I'm glad you brought that up about regenerative agriculture. I've always had a hard time with my R's since a little kid, so bear with me. But I would love to do a podcast with you offline uh, another time, I should say. And we can go deep on that because we probably don't have the time now. But that is something that we could definitely talk a while about. Does anyone else have anything they might want to add just to set the kind of foundation of like the, what we've been doing leading up to the summit before we start to transition? I'll just say my experience of um, what I perceived masculinity or masculine energy to be, which is um, a lot of what Sarah said, action and application of intuition uh, into like the real world. But for me personally, Decision-making is something I struggle with a lot. And what I really wanted to explore was listening to like what I call my knowing. And it just sits right here in my heart. And when I literally like listen, as weird as that sounds, to my heart, as opposed to having it filter through my prefrontal cortex and then trying to decide between five options, (laughs) it always seems to steer me right. But I've had such a hard time doing that and um so i think that's something of uh the masculine that i really wanted to explore just like decision making and trusting like that what you know is is right there's one other piece that came up as jaylene was speaking and that is um, earlier and that is that the masculine creates the structure from which the feminine can create Mm -hmm. and so it gives this like i think i always think of it as like bumpers on a bowling alley like it allows whatever is flowing through to stay in the lane and without that structure and that order the feminine does not feel safe to create and flow because she it's like if you think of a river bank right like the banks of the river allow the river to flow in a specific way but when there's no banks it just becomes a lake right or an ocean and so the it's like the masculine is the banks of the river that allows the water to flow I love that. That's, I just heard Aaron Alexander say on his podcast the other day, you need essentially like structure and stability in order to have flexibility, which is paradoxical, but it's really true. Can you say that again? It's structure and what did I say? <laughs> stability. S- structure and stability to have flexibility. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's such a great quote. 
Well, this is a really good discussion and we're not here to really go too deep on our thoughts of what the masculine versus the feminine and sacred union and all that type of stuff is. We're here to talk about the fun stuff. Not That's not fun, but we're here to talk about the actual experience of the Fit for Service Summit because, you know, so many of us, I'm sure you guys have experienced, especially you, Brett, the, it being your first summit or Jane Lee your second, Sarah and I, I think it's been like our fifth or something. And I still get it. I'm sure you do too. But like a lot of friends and family are asking questions. What do you guys actually do? So, you know, let's, uh, let's kind of unpack this. And it was such an amazing experience. Like this was like kids at play. Like, you know, if we think about sports and I might uh, ask one of you to jump in and help me out to describe this, but kind of the idea here was like, there's a lot of structure. There's a lot of masculinity to teamwork, right. And the way we play sports and the idea of this summit was to sort of rewrite the script in a way of competing with one e in each other to build each other up in a healthy way, as opposed to, hey, I know a few of you have seen this, but I recently put a video out on YouTube about the movie uh, White Men Can't Jump. And, you know, talk about toxic masculinity the whole time on the court, they're just talking shit the whole time and they're deceiving one another, you know, Wesley Snipes character and Woody Harrelson, both of them are conning the other back and forth and they're just, it's the perfect demonstration of what toxic or shadow or, you know, uh, wounded masculine, whatever you want to call it, um, would be. So this summit was an opportunity to compete in a way that was really to build each other up. And without going into the details, which we will, but I just want to pause right there and see what comes up for you ladies. Yeah. I love that you said rewrite the script on competition. I grew up playing sports. I'm very into athletics and sports and stuff as a female. And I think it's definitely like a wound of mine throughout growing up of like, how do I show that aspect of me when I'm hanging around females or like, how can I have that while I'm playing with the guys and like always trying to like keep up with the guys because it, you can, it's harder to find in just groups of women that are really competitive and stuff. And so like, I feel like it was a really awesome experience and to see how other women responded who aren't necessarily grew up with sports like I did and how it really was like able to to rewrite the script for them I think in in competition and for them to see like oh my god I I did these things that I had no idea that I was capable of um, and I think that's what sports and competition and like physicality really offers us so um, yeah, I think that was a huge part of the summit is like really rewriting the script for men and women, like a lot of people who might have wounds of, of being teased in high school or college or something like that. Um, I think it really, yeah, definitely had some rewriting of the script on competition. So that was a big piece. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, like for me, it was the absolute safest space to be the most aggressive, animalistic version of myself that I think I've ever been. I grew up, you know, I did all the sports when I was young, soccer, basketball, but then I started cheerleading when I was in uh, like fifth grade and I did competitive cheerleading, school cheerleading, all the things. Um, and so it was definitely a lot of, it was very competitive, but in this way that we had to like hold in any sort of like aggressive, like we had to be cute or like pretty and we couldn't just like let it out. And I have this very vivid memory of being at state championship in high school and we were all in a huddle and we were just jumping and getting really excited. And I started to get like, kind of like masculine, angry into it, like rah. And all of my friends just like got wide-eyed and looked at me like I was a crazy person. And I felt like it fit for service. I could be a person and everybody was right there with me. And it was the best. Oh my gosh. It was just the best experience of my whole life. It was so amazing. <laughs> watching you. I mean, I know we'll get into this a little bit later, but like watching you, Brett, like hold those steel maces 
and just like own it and stare down your opponent. I don't even remember who you were up against, but I, um, that was such a great moment. And it was like, beautiful. I think another part of the masculine is like perseverance, you know, like pushing through when it's hard and you stepped up in such a beautiful way and you owned that kind of warrior energy. And I could see how you were pulling it up, pulling up that kind of like angry, like, no, I'm not going to let you win. I've got this. I'm going to own this. And like, there's such a warrior element to competition too, that I think is often lost, especially in the West where like, we don't really celebrate the warrior. It's more like a sacrifice, right? It's more like the gladiator being sacrificed. Whereas if you look at like some of the Aboriginal cultures that do the hakas and things like that, it's very much like a warrior tribe going up against another warrior tribe. And that was such a, a part of what we did that week was to embody the warrior element of competition as well. And you did that. So, I mean, both you and Jaylene did that so beautifully, but I will never forget Brett. Like that moment was such a beautiful moment. It was amazing. That was amazing. And I have to say that you were like essential in my honing in on that warrior energy. I had actually had a conversation with Sarah prior to the summit because I was feeling so out of my element trying to find a costume and like download this warrior thing. It just was not, it just, I had it in me apparently. I didn't know I did, but I just, it felt so far left of what I'm like accustomed to doing. And so she recommended that I find like a character or um, some someone, something that like embodied the warrior energy that I wanted to bring to the event. And I thought on it and I couldn't, nothing was coming to mind. And then I remembered this movie that I saw just, gosh, probably six months ago. It's an older movie. It's called Lucy. Oh, yeah. And oh my God, I was like, Lucy. And I loved that movie so much. The first time I saw it, I didn't want to watch it again because I didn't want to ruin it. Mm-hmm. I sat down that night, I watched it three times and I was like, I'm being fucking Lucy in that ring. And so I just like went in with that knowing, you know, like I stepped, I just knew like my arms would have fallen off before I left the ring. Like I just knew. So thank you, Sarah. You dominated and you both did, all three of you did, and everyone out there did. And for the listeners, because we're kind of going down memory lane and I'm just sitting here like not being present and putting myself back in that experience and time traveling, which is so much fun. But at the same point, like, hey, we're let us paint a picture for the listeners because I didn't do the best job of saying the stage. All I said was we were competing. So time to get into our masculine and get out of that flow into some structure to paint a picture, if you will. Talk about applying things. Um, So basically there's like 150 people in fit for service members and there's five coaches. Now there's five elements and I didn't really realize this. I always thought about four elements. I don't know about you uh, three, but we were the fifth element, ether, that doesn't get talked about enough. So basically what happened was each coach, since there's five and there's five elements, ether, earth, air, fire, water, wind. I can't count, but I think that's five. That's all of them. Yeah. So basically 150 people divide up into five different sub tribes of one container being fit for service to compete against each other and work with their coach to best represent that element. Now, the four of us on this call, we're all ether. So that's part of the reason why I wanted to bring uh, you three in. I want to bring some people on my team because we had closer experience with the games. And I'm not sure that we will do a deep dive in terms of what else happened at the summit because there are amazing workshops and other things. But like, we're all posting these wild pictures on Instagram and social media and showing them to our friends and whatnot of us looking like lawyers and all this like wild stuff. And I'm sure people are like, what is this about? So let this be our opportunity to tell the story about that really. So we were team ether and for what, like a month or something leading up to the summit, we were having weekly zoom calls or no Google meet to be technical, but whatever virtual remote calls um, to go over our tribal dances, what uh, competition, like games we were going to compete in and to bond as a team. So that's kind of like to set the stage there. Now let's start to unpack that a little bit more. What do you guys want to add to that? 
I don't think I really have nothing kind of came up. So if you want to keep talking and then maybe. Yeah, I, I thought it was just kind of cool, like for a month leading up to it, that we got to meet with each other. And really, our coach was Aubrey. So we had, you know, all the coaches are amazing. And it was really cool to connect with Aubrey with that. And, you know, he seemed to have this type of connection to the element of ether. Like it was cool how each coach connected to their element. And one of the things that really stood out to me with Aubrey's leadership was his emphasis of the warrior's ethos. And we talked about this on a ether integration call we had the other day. And, you know, this kind of what we were talking about earlier to, um, I don't remember, I think it was you, Jaylene, that said, but like rewriting the script, um, you know, that sort of thing, you know, Aubrey hammered that into our heads, like, Hey, no matter if you win or lose your competition, you're a winner. Like to me, my interpretation, because I'm not going to say, hey, he said this, but like what I got of it was for me, I don't like dancing. I'm afraid of dancing. I, I do anything but to dance for a month leading up to this. My competition was going to be steel club mace because i was like i can hold some steel clubs and sure whatever and that won't be too hard but when we got there in austin texas and we met as a team in person and aubrey did, went even deeper on like the you know warriors ethos and there's no like winning or losing i realized that the only way i can lose this is by doing anything but dancing because i'm robbing myself and i end up losing the dancing anyways by one however if i won the steel club to me that would have been losing and that's the difference so if there's anything that y'all would want to add about warriors ethos and how that impacted you i think that would be a good discussion what comes up for me is um, part of the warrior's ethos for me ended up being about play. And it was really interesting talking to everyone after the summit. Everyone is a part of Ether. <clears throat> ether, by the way, uh, I just did. I, I kind of understand the element of Ether, but I just looked it up and Wikipedia describes it as the air that the gods breathed. So it's not the air that the mortals breathe, it's the air that the God breathes, and it, it occupies the space that they live. And within it, within ether are all the other four elements, so it kind of encompasses every other element. And going into this competition, I also thought I was going to do something like tug of war or the steel mace hold. And I ended up doing dance, which is something I'm really comfortable with. So in that way, I didn't push myself to the challenge. But at the same time, throughout the competition, I recognize that I, I'm not really a competitive person. The only person that I'm competitive with is myself. I've never been competitive. I only care if I am becoming a better human to the person I was yesterday. And so any of those competitions would have been difficult for me because for me, my challenge was being seen and dancing is the most expressive I could have been. And so to be seen in my expression was the most that I could push myself for that competition. It wasn't the hardest thing. It wasn't the, like the thing that was going to push me physically, but it was the thing that was going to push me spiritually and emotionally and mentally to become a better human than I was the day before. And so I think there's such a element of play that is a part of both the feminine and the masculine and it, it, depending on its expression. But that was really what I got out of it is just to play and also to support with like that warrior ethos, like support everybody else that was in the ring and like yelling as loud as I could yell and jumping up and down as high as I could jump and just going crazy every time. It was so much fun. Yeah, I'll jump in. I loved being on Aubrey's team and the warrior ethos. And it was a huge full circle moment actually from the feminine trimester, I was looking it up on the Fit for Service app, but I did the float tank for the first time. It was my first float tank ever at the beginning of the feminine trimester. And I wrote down that I had this vision at the end. It was all about the feminine. It was all of these things of like, trust yourself. Like you can go into the darkness and, and like just kind of some random things that were very personal. And then I just had this vision that was like, warrior time will come, like lean into the feminine now. 
and like we had no idea that this was going to be the competition there was no like element where we even knew we were doing like the games or or that I was going to be on Aubrey's team who was pretty much the only one who really talked about the warrior ethos of all the coaches so that was like huge for me that he was talking about the warrior ethos so much and kind of like contrary to what you said or like doing the one that was most uncomfortable I didn't do that I I did tug of war I knew I was going to do one of the physical ones because that is just what I wanted to test myself and like for me I think it would have been easy for me to do dance and though it would have been uncomfortable for me to dance it would have been easy to like brush off if I lost because it's like oh well I'm not good at that anyways so I shouldn't I didn't Mm -hmm. need to win but I am very competitive. And so I knew that if I lost at tug of war, I would be fucking pissed. And so like, that was my challenge where like, it was this element of realness where it's like, I really feel like I should win this tug of war. And like, I won't be able to hide if I lose. And like, that's my struggle. Cause it won't be an easy, like brush off thing. So I was, I really like, drew that warrior ethos when I was in there and largely like a lot of my my journey has been warrior ethos like I said I, I'm I'm very competitive and tend to lean towards a lot of masculine activities in the way that I live I did wilderness survival school and I like lived on a farm and I'm very like like using my body and doing doing some kind of like intense things and um so yeah, that, that was really big for me. Um, and just moving forward and like the work that I'm doing, I feel like I'm going to have to summon a lot of warrior energy. I mean, I do already of just kind of looking at things that are not so easy to look at, but not looking away. So yeah, it was, it was really special to have Aubrey as a coach and to see how he leads and to just think about embodying that as a leader, as like I grow in my own life so I think that that was huge yeah there's I have so many different things floating around and really connected to kind of what both of you said in a way but I think for me the warrior ethos is not about going in with this attitude of like seek and destroy it's about I'm here to serve and if that means I have to destroy someone then so be it And um, I had a a conversation with a fellow Fit for Service member the other day, and he was talking about actually having spoken to Eric Godsey and asking him, like, gosh, how do you do it? You have people coming up to you all the time and, like, crying to you. Like, how do you do it? And he's like, I don't. And he's like, what do you mean? And he's like, I do nothing. Like, he's not trying, you know? He just is there, and he listens, and it comes through. And so in that spirit, which feels to me sort of like connected to that warrior ethos is not, you know, going with this in like malintention, but just like being there and, um, and sort of being done. Uh, the night before I had every intention of wrestling, I used to wrestle my friends when I was in middle school and I like, it was where I got out my aggression. And, um, so I got, I got in the ring and on it when we started working out and um, I lost like three times, <laughs> but I was still like stoked. That's what I was going to do. I was going to wrestle. And that evening, the another person that was attending the summit was staying with me and she asked me if I had tried the steel mace hold. And I was like, no. And she's like, do you want to try it? So I was like, sure. So I went and I got weights um, and I just hold She's like, do you want me to time you? It was like 10 o'clock at night. And I was like, sure. And so I just held them there forever. And then um, I got to like three minutes, 36 seconds. And when we practiced the second day, we practiced all the events except for still mace hold. And Aubrey said, hey, did anyone time themselves? And so I said my time out loud and everybody looked at me like it was a good time. And so I was like, all right. So it was weird because of all this practice I had done for wrestling, I was inquiring through um, <laughs> group calls and stuff before about, hey, Aubrey, can you set up a, um, a, you know, like a coaching kind of wrestling program, a meetup or something. And then I just like went in the ring, not having practiced nothing and um, was able to have a good time and beat my opponent. So um, twice (laughs) with uh, the warrior ethos, it's just like what I took home from that was just like, 
you don't necessarily have to try, you know, just do nothing and let yourself be done. If that makes any sense. Absolutely. Jane Lane, did you have something you want to say? Yeah, just to kind of solidify the warrior ethos that we talked about a couple of times. I think it was like, you don't know yourself unless you test yourself. And that's what competition does. And we don't have a lot of, you know, we have our jobs and we have certain places where we maybe can test ourselves. But sometimes, you know, especially in this world, kind of talking about the toxic masculinity, where now it's sort of there's fear and there's shame around having that like pushing element like hey you can do better hey that was great but also I think there's more in you and it's not like a shame thing but it's a way and like like you know you just need someone to help like pull that out of you so I think we talked about that a lot and that's what Aubrey was so good at as a coach of like that warrior ethos of like you're testing yourself in this competition too, right? It's not if you won the tug of war necessarily, but did you do the best that you could do? Did you try your hardest? Did you leave it all out on the field, the court, in the world? So I really liked that element. It's like we were just setting a container to draw something out of us. Amazing. So I want to get into what it actually looked like. So for people listening, you can... um you can visualize it, you know, and if you're driving, you know, if you're anything like me, you're able to look on the road, but kind of visualize it too, or whatever your case may be, but let's paint the picture, if you will. Um, so we talked about the Zoom calls and, you know, everything that led up to it. And then we met in Austin. And when we got out there, each of the five different elements, the uh, sub tribes, met and trained with their teams for probably like three days for a couple hours a day going into this. And you, you guys might be listening being like, well, what'd you do? So that's what we're going to tell you. And, you know, uh, part of this competition was each of us had to compete against someone else on another team. But in addition to that, when we first got there for the day of the elemental games, as they were called, each element present like a war dance. Was that what it was called, Sarah? A war dance? A dance? Yeah. So there's ether, there's wind, there's fire, there's earth, there's water. Now, each of these elements were to create costumes to represent those elements. So kind of like what Brett was talking about earlier, being outside of your comfort zone with costumes totally resonates with me. Like I'm, 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 I'm always uncomfortable and like, Oh, what should I do? Whatever. And we're like doing face paint and all the different stuff. So uh, we did that. We trained, which I think Brett or Jane Lane, one of you guys mentioned, uh, you know, trying wrestling or different things. And we went over the warriors ethos and it was just amazing team bonding. Right. And what was really cool was the day of the elemental games, like every day leading up to it, we went to an Airbnb, right? And we just uh, would work together. And that morning, we, we probably all woke up at like 5 or 6 a.m., right? Like, this is ridiculous. Like, we're out here, you know, not, not to work and get paid. Like, we're out, we're out here to do personal and self uh, and soul development, really. And we're waking up really early and... Yeah, we go over to this house, right? And the women, all you ladies are getting your hair did and, you know, your makeup and all that type of stuff. I remember like putting war paint on myself being like, am I doing this right? I don't know. But we're all getting like dressed up. And then we do one final like uh, dress rehearsal or whatever walkthrough of our dance. And then we get on the bus together. Now imagine like, I don't know if any of you guys want to jump in here and describe in detail what we looked like on the bus from like the music to the dancing on the bus to what we actually looked like with the costumes. Does anyone want to share that? Sarah, okay. I think our costumes were very much like kind of a Nordic, like Viking warrior. Like we, more than any other tribe, I think embodied this like very kind of like dark warrior Nordic, like Scandinavian kind of Viking element or not element, but aspect. And then, so our costume was, our color was purple and black, actually purple and black. And we all had like runes, which are like Nordic symbols painted on us. And we all had like black, like face paint across our eyes and bra big braids in our hair and things like that. And we're all on the bus dancing to Laffy Taffy. <laughs> and, and like, 
getting down to some like good music and it was it was like one of the best moments of my life it was so much fun <laughs> especially considering the, considering the absurdity of how we looked dancing to a song like Laffy Taffy <laughs> I'll never get that Laffy Taffy song out of my head unfortunately <laughs> But I, I was into it at the end when we got there to location and there was a remix of Metallica's Kill Em All. Oh, I was going wild on that. I think it was Kill Em All, Seek and Destroy, one of those uh, songs. I don't remember. But um, so each of the elements had their own bus and who knows what they were doing on their other ones. I'm sure they were doing different stuff. Maybe Air because they were more godlike and angelic. They were uh, not so aggressive with like Seek and Destroy with them and talking. <laughs> who knows what they were up to. But they had an amazing dance. So anyways, everyone got there. Then there was just this vibe like i mean this is austin texas in early august it might have been the last days of july i think it was early august and the rain was just yeah. pouring down like right that made it so intense like yeah. I was having a whole thing like goosebumps like it yeah was incredible that it was pouring rain at like seven in the morning when the night before and all of the previous days were like 100 degrees and then this day, it just is pouring rain, not just drizzling, not just like cloudy, not just lightning in the background, just straight downpour like yeah. that. And we all walked in and like, we just, it's a slow walk. And we like, we were the last team off the bus. And so everyone's like looking at us and we're like walking in. And I just remember like people actually being like, whoa, like they were not expecting us to be so like scary looking everyone else was kind of like pretty and a lot of people wore skirts and stuff and like I'm sure we had that on ours but like we definitely played up the intensity so like that walking in and that like circling up like as it's just raining and then whoever that guy I forget his name but I was just gonna say oh the drum, yeah yeah like that was it was intense <laughs> Yeah, those drums, man, talk about effect. Between the drums and the rain, it was like, it, and the costumes, it made it real, you know? It's like we all decided, like Aubrey was saying, to dress up and play pretend, but because we all decided that, like, it mattered, it mattered, and it made it real. And, yeah, it's like once-in-a-lifetime experience. Because, like, when do you get to do that as an adult? It was ridiculous. Like, I wish I could relive that so many times. And I just get spirit chills even thinking about it. And then we got to talk about Matt Vincent. He was the MC, and I'm not sure of his background. I think he's an Olympian. Is that right? Is that, or... He's a strong man competitor. Strong man competitor. So, you know, big <laughs> buff guy. And, you know, he's like, he, uh, kind of like Shawn Michaels type uh, or like, you know, retro WWF wrestler type look, you know, and big buff guy and like nailed it to the T with like being the MC and welcoming everyone there. Like, welcome to the tribal games, you know, like <laughs> things like that. And everyone's lined up in this huge arena outside and so we're not getting poured on you know like it's this um like almost horse arena type thing and yeah it was just unbelievable we were the last team that did our dance we should you guys want to talk about the other team's dances or just go to straight to ours or what are you feeling okay, quick we'll talk about the other dances might be a lot yeah well if there's any that's incredible out. but what's that if there, I really, so earth went first, which, you know, I almost said something that I'm happy I didn't say, but yeah, with, let's just leave it at this with plant medicine ceremonies, we typically open up to the, the different directions and you say a prayer and it was so beautiful the way that the earth team set the stage for the day by yeah. like enacting the prayer to set the stage for the ceremony because we talk about this a lot in fit for service like hey you don't need to use plant medicine for something to be a ceremony and let this summit be a ceremony so it was literally the opening ceremony like opening up and setting the space and cleansing it so i just thought that like i we all voted for other teams like performances or whatever to choose the winner and i thought they were all great but because of like the thoughtfulness of that, I, and it just resonated so much with me and the execution was flawless. I, I'd vote for Earth. I thought that was incredible. 
I agree. And I'm glad that you said that because there's a piece of me that part of why the drums and the rain and everything was so powerful was actually because so Autumn and I had been like in the woods just doing kind of a decompression the night before the competition, like before the Sat Song concert. And we started walking over to go to the concert and we heard somebody playing this flute in the middle of the of the yard and like at first we thought it was like somebody signaling for the concert and then we thought oh, okay it's just a fit for service person like playing this flute we like go in t- and everybody's like already in the concert we go in and we like sit down and we just listen to this man like play this beautiful flute and then as he closes he like does the prayer to all of the directions and like says this really intimate prayer and like he sees us there and he like didn't even like we just watched from afar and he like kept going which was great and then it ended up being the drum guy (laughs) and we like walked to the song concert with him and he's like obviously you know I don't I can't remember like where he's from and stuff but he's very like was tuned into the elements was like I just wanted to like welcome the land I wanted to like invite all the elements coming in and like right after he did that there was like a lightning in the distance and he was like, the rains are coming. Oh and then God. it was freaking <laughs> great. Like, so I had like a special piece that like only Autumn and I got to like experience, but it just made the fact that it was raining and the fact that earth then did that. Like I felt very strongly powerful towards like earth's dance as well, like going first and all of that. So I definitely agree with you. Like it was such a ceremony, such tingles. Like it was, yeah. You know, and the interesting thing, just like kind of behind the scenes about the Earth team, because um, a friend that was on their team was staying with me the whole time. We were, you know, talking about our teams and talking about what we were experiencing and stuff. And she was really worried because like during the three days before she was going early to make costumes, she was feeling like they weren't prepared. They had two women that were pregnant on their team that had to like drop off. Um, somebody I think may have dislocated their arm um, at some point. I'm not sure if it was because they were competing or how that happened, but they were they were really struggling <laughs> um, leading up to. So the fact that they came out there and just like nailed it like that, and the song that they were singing, "Mama, I'm Coming Home," that was so cool. Loved that. Forgot about that. Very cool. Well, thank you for sharing that, both of you. And Jaylene, what what a powerful and magical story. I mean, you know, at these summits, when we come together, there is magic is undeniable. And when I do these brochurality videos where I take bro type movies and I break down hair, hidden spirituality in these seemingly silly comedies, um, one of the things I say when I close them out is the magic is abundant and it's just up for us to accept it and choose it and to live in a world of magic, you know, and it, I'm looking outside right now and, you know, it's gray outside and it's been foggy out here in Santa Cruz. And sometimes that gets me down. And, you know, if I let that, the weather dictate my mood, there's certain things that keep the magic from being there, you know, and we all have it, whatever it might be. And one of the biggest mind viruses of our fallen state of consciousness right now is this fear mentality and the victim mentality and just all these negative emotions that are coming from the programming and conditioning of society. So when we come together and it's people like-minded that are quote unquote doing the work um, and really into spirituality, it is absolutely incredible when stories like that, that you share, Jaylene, um, unfold. It's, it's so powerful. And those are the little moments that get forgotten. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I'll just add, it was especially potent because like I'm working regenerative agriculture, I'm Mm -hmm. stepping into actually working with clients on their land, consulting on how to actually implement this. And so we were in the woods because like the whole ecosystem out there and like that environment and just like the oak savanna is the exact same type of ecosystem that we're going to be working on with the client that we currently have. So we were actually out there like talking to the land. So to then come down from that and like stumble upon this man playing the flute for us, like blessing the land, like it was just just another yeah added element of that magic so thank you for reminding me of like all of those all of those parts of it synchro city i love it love the synchronicities cool so 
we don't have a ton of time left and there's so much to cover and we'll probably touch on some of the other things like you you mentioned the satsang uh concert which i mean you know anyone that's into like yoga for example have, has heard his song in a yoga class at some point or you know like the guy is just unbelievable and it was really cool to see him in a uh, perform in a very small container Let's just wrap up the games, though. Probably not do our dance because we don't need to get into that. But Sarah was our queen. We did have a queen as a part of our dance. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, Sarah, in terms of like being seen, like talk about being seen. Like you had a team of approximately 25 people with audience of the other tribes making up at least a hundred plus people uh, there. And you were at the forefront of our, our presentation of the ether dance um, being the queen. So kudos to you. That's being seen. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, it was a fun experience. I talked about this on the integration call that we did with the team, but it was something that I felt super called to, but then was terrified to step into. And it was such a big lesson for me about putting the fear aside when you feel the call to do something, even if it's scary, just putting it aside and just stepping into it and owning it. And honestly, I kind of blacked out in that moment. I don't really remember much, but I think that's part of the fun, right? It's like a roller coaster or being on stage or something like that. It's just, it's part of it. <laughs> Like so many people said that. I think pretty much every person that competed or danced or whatever said, I blacked out. I really have no recollection of what just happened. It's interesting to think about what go, what happens in our minds that causes that. Fear. Yeah. <laughs> Adrenaline. Or channeling, potentially. But yeah, it's like you. if you were thinking about every move you were making, you wouldn't really be in your body and just like in the moment. So yeah. I think for most of us, it's, that's kind of where you want to be. I know just speaking from experience of like in sports and stuff, like, I don't remember every move I'm making when I'm playing a basketball game, but like, then all of a sudden I'm scoring, right. You're not like yeah. thinking logically like, Oh shit. I'm like actively like moving this way from the person. So I think that was cool that so many people who maybe haven't experienced that, who don't play sports, they're like, well, I blacked out. Like, how did I do that? And yeah. it reminds us that like, we don't have to consciously think about every step we're making when we just like drop in and like trust ourselves. Yeah. And I, I think of it as uh, Pixar and Disney's movie soul where they demonstrate channeling so well and being in flow and showing like uh, the higher self being in the astral plane, like when Joe Gardner, the main character is playing piano or when they're in the astral plane and soul 22 that doesn't want to go back to earth is like knocking people out of being in the astral plane when they're in flow. For example, you brought basketball. There was like someone who was uh, uh, NBA player you could imagine they probably were and they're in like the astral plane then she throws something at him in the astral when he's going and dunk or something like that and then in the 3D then he falls over and doesn't do the dunk right but the idea wow. is totally there and yeah, if if anyone hasn't watched the movie Soul or if you've seen it and you want to revisit it, check the show notes of this podcast. I do. Uh, I have. I linked a sixty minute video where I kind of explain the concepts of Soul to go deeper down spirituality and each of the themes. But anyways, yeah, absolutely amazing. I definitely think that that is channeling when you quote unquote blackout. Personally, we've talked about the games and the competitions, so. We haven't said it straight up, but there's, I think, five different options you could choose from. A dance-off, a steel, ma steel club mace hold, which was five or ten pounds uh, each, five for the men, or five for the ladies, I think, and ten for the men or something like that. Yeah, and it was just, uh, there was that, there was tug-of-war, there was wrestling. Oh, the ball toss, we won't even bother with that because that would be too hard to explain, take too long. But essentially, there are these different options. And it was really cool because we had that amazing MC, Matt Vincent, that would, you know, have such great commentary, you know, for yeah. each one. And I, I don't know if there's anything that comes up just overall about the competitions. And then we can kind of start to wrap this up with some of the other events at the summit. I just have one thought the the thing that I thought was the coolest about it is like I had no idea through the whole thing who was winning or who was losing I was so engaged in every single like face-off I 
didn't know and really didn't care. And that was like a really cool feeling. Yeah, I think largely this just to bring it back out to like how this relates to kind of the divine masculine is like we as tribes just made up the dances like we had to 25 strangers over zoom over the course of a couple weeks like with the help of coaches who kind of had a vision for the element but like we just all made up what we were going to do the fact that we had a queen that was that was solely ours the fact that we had you know a lot of other people's like airs dance was fairly choreographed like they spent a significant amount of time planning that and so for us like i feel like ours really was too like just just a practice of getting in resonance with each other like we're the only ones who did that sort of like i don't know what we call it like monkey dance where we were just we had to follow our team. Like we had to get in resonance as a team and we had to let like Sarah just did whatever she was going to do, whatever she was channeling. And we were following that. So I think that's kind of tying it back to how this is, this was ultimately like the divine masculine where they just set the container that we were going to have these games that we're going to do these dances. And there's a little bit of structure there, but then like, quote unquote chaos ensued and the chaos was where the beauty was and where the individuality was and where the creativity was so I think that yeah that's how it all kind of ties back to the to to what that divine masculine can be is just setting a container and then not controlling to try to win but letting everyone like challenge themselves and see what comes out of them Thanks for bringing that back, Jaylene. And you know, what comes up for me when you bring it back to like divine masculine and the experience of the games, I remember being like scared shitless to dance in front of everyone and and not know what the hell I'm going to do, but just be like, whatever. And I remember afterwards, like some of my really close friends in FFS on other teams coming up and giving me like the biggest hugs and like saying I'm so proud of you and just like just so and just uh, anyone coming up and I just got done watching um I think it's called Mouse at the Palace which is a documentary on Netflix that documents the um the Indiana Pacers and the Detroit Pistons brawl like 10 plus years ago with you know where the players went up in the stands and the players were being shit out of each other or you know you think of hockey and how there's fights or any of this and Yes, we know in professional sports that most of them are still friends off the court, right? But to take this back to the beginning, when we're talking about like rewriting the script and building each other up, like at the end of the day, like this wasn't about winning and losing, you know, and that just goes to show it there, like how much love was in that container. And we went at least four hours nonstop of 150 people squaring off against each other. And someone in our tribe um, mentioned this too, her favorite part of the pictures is looking at the people in the background that are screaming at the top of their lungs, cheering people on and just the energy there. It was unbelievable. It was seriously one of the best days of my life. It was so incredible to witness. And like there were, I've had a couple of people reflect to me just what you, what you just said, Sam, about like screaming at the top of my lungs and I've had a couple of people reflect like watching that come out of you what brought out something in me. And so like that was such an element of that as well as like really, really authentically and enthusiastically being behind not just your own team, but every other team too, you know, and like cheering everybody on. Absolutely. I loved seeing my boy, Tony Cannoli on Team Water just up there in everyone's face. She's always... It's so funny, but there's always, yeah, I could go on and on. What a, an amazing day that night we had a unity dance party and that was all about coming back together as a tribe. And, you know, we split off in these sub tribes, but we're one tribe. And, you know, one thing that came up for me probably six months after I did ayahuasca the first time was going to an uh, 49ers game. And I went, I kind of uprooted my whole entire life and went very hermit after ayahuasca, but previously, you know, hobnobbing in Silicon Valley and going to law Niners games, dating a Niners cheerleader, all that type of stuff. Right. 
And when I went back to a Niners game for the first time, I remember a buddy had like, you know, really good seats, lower bowl. We had the whole thing, like the, the VIP food and all that. And we were sitting there in the lower bowl, just a few rows up from the stadium. They had to fly over with the jets that day. And I remember being like outside of my body, just being like, what the hell is going on? Why are there, why are we like, you think of the San Francisco giants uh, 10 plus years ago, Brian snow uh, almost got killed. And this happens all the time with fans uh, being each other up in the stands, getting drunk, all this type of stuff. It's like, okay, first off this thought kind of came into me as like, if we're so proud to be Americans, why are we beating each other up over our teams? And then I go, I zoomed out a little bit more. And this is all during the Star Spangled Banner, you know, and being in the lower bowl, at a brand new stadium with, you know, 70,000 people there. And I'm having these thoughts and I'm thinking, well, what's so special about America? Like, why, why is that the problem that we have so much pride in our countries that other countries start to defeat ourselves? And then I zoom out even further because I'm looking at, you know, we're one universe, one people and having these deep thoughts. I'm starting to think like, it's one universe, one people. And just like this, these deep thoughts of just like togetherness. And that's what the whole theme of this summit was about and what to bring it full circle that night after the elemental games, when we had the unity dance party, it was like, yes, we split off, but we're one tribe. And outside of this tribe, we're not exclusive. You know, it's called fit for service. We're here to be of service to the community, not to the community, to the world and to the universe um and beyond so that's um it was pretty epic <laughs> perfect way to end it sam <laughs> dope i guess we can close with charles eisenstein uh sarah why don't you tell us about charles eisenstein and we'll close it there well what should i tell you about him <laughs> no charles eisenstein was absolutely incredible and i don't know about for you um you all but for me, that was such a pinnacle moment of the entire summit where he talked about, you know, he was very real with like where we are in the world and the, and the state that the world is in at the moment. But as hard as it was for many of us to hear the reality of what he was speaking about, I could also feel a collective exhale in the room when he started to speak and the way that it alleviated the pressure from all of us you know, he talked about how we're kind of, um, we're not going back to the normal that we knew. And um, I could feel the collective exhale that was almost a relief from everyone in the room of being able to hear that and accept it, and then talk with a great amount of hope about where we, where we go from here, and how we rebuild. And it was so beautiful to have him there. And he, he was present for the entire games day. He, he sat on the sidelines and watched the entire day. And uh, for anybody who knows, who doesn't know his work, I highly recommend you check it out. And if you do, you know what an amazing human he is. But one of my favorite quotes, and I'm sure you all would agree, is a dandelion in a field is unkillable. And that kind of became the motto of the weekend, I think, for many of us. Nice recap. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I had forgotten that. And I was wondering, we have this uh, app that everybody communicates on in the Fit for Service group. And somebody posted about, are we all getting dandelion tattoos? And I was like, what is that from? And now I'm reminded. (laughs) Yeah, I think, um, yeah, the Charles Eisenstein speech um, and just him being there and the fact that, so another one of these like synchronicities was he was in the kitchen at Aubrey's house on the day of the competition while we were ready. And I don't think anybody, I didn't notice it. I don't think anybody really realized it until like, pretty late and then I was just in the kitchen like I had I think I was like fully ready by that time and I just see like somebody pouring cereal and I was like who is that like I knew that it wasn't by Lana and like at first I thought because at one point I'd come into Aubrey's house and like there was somebody cleaning it or something so I was like oh maybe it's just I don't know who would you know Aubrey might have a lot of people around his house (laughs) but he was pouring cereal and he's like a little bit older you know and so I was like huh like I wonder who that would be and then I was like is that Charles Eisenstein and I didn't fully know exactly what he looked like but and then I was like are you Charles Eisenstein and he was like yeah like very casual and it was just like one of those moments where I was like oh my god like I'm in Aubrey Marcus's kitchen and I just met Charles Eisenstein 
And through some other synchronicities that happened actually the week after Summit, which I have had both in T1 and T2, hugely impactful experiences in the week after when once kind of the chaos leaves and there's some some smaller groups, like I ended up becoming very close with someone who I hadn't even met the entire week of Summit, never had been on a call with him, like never had really knew who he was. And so like, that was amazing. Um, But I went back, I had to go back like a year ago because of like something that got brought up. And I'd actually read the coronation, which is Charles Eisenstein's article that he came out with about coronavirus in probably April of 2020. And I posted about it back then. I remember I was living on a farm. It was, it was my first experience of like being in agriculture, learning about food systems and having a a worldwide pandemic happen and how much that affected like getting food to people. And I just remember being in a state of like not knowing where to go, where people were talking about saying where I thought sanity was. And Charles Eisenstein talked a lot about that. And I remember finding his article and like feeling hope. And I feel like I don't remember exactly the synchronicities, but like through finding his podcast, I think ultimately is how I found Aubrey Marcus's podcast. Ultimately is how I'm in fit for service right now. So really he's the one who like started it all for me. And it was exactly a year ago that I like posted about that. So it was just like a huge, hugely monumental moment to have him here speaking about it. And it's quite eerie to go back and read the coronation that he wrote in April of 2020 with everything that's going on right now. So I would highly recommend it. You can listen to an audio version on SoundCloud. It's only like an hour long. And another thing that all of these points kind of tie back to that he talked about in his speech was like, being in person is a synchronicity generator. Like you don't really have these synchronistic moments via technology, via Zoom. As much as it's great that we can sit here and do this right now when we need to, there's so much if we just think that we can we can move everything that's in person online there's so much that is lost like for example me saying that I met him in the kitchen me stumbling upon the man who was playing the flute like all of these little synchronicities that only happen when you're in person um, he that really touched me when he spoke about that in in his speech so it was definitely he had some powerful powerful words Amazing. Thank you for sharing those stories, Jaylene. And guys, if you want to check out the essay that Jaylene's talking about that Charles Eisenstein um, wrote about the pandemic in March of 2020, it is in the show notes. So you can check it out. And um, Charles Eisenstein, we didn't really give him an introduction because it's not like the guy has a big following and everyone knows who he is, but he is the author of the book, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible, in addition to maybe two to three more books, I believe. And he's just a philosopher really. And just has some amazing work. I even uh, got the book for my dad and was like, you got to check it out. He's got the Sandy project as well. Just an awesome dude. Definitely look him up. And there's so much of the summit that we didn't even touch on. There's so much that happens at these summits. They're absolutely incredible. I mean, that's that's why we're here, right? And for anyone that's listening and wants to learn more, feel free to reach out to myself or Brett or Jaylene or Sarah uh, to have one one, ask more questions, follow Fit for Service on Instagram. You can see either on Fit for Services page, I know it's on Aubrey's page. I'll just put it in the show notes and make it easy. But Aubrey put out a like seven minute video of um, a recap of the summit. So if you want to actually have your mind's eye meet what actually happened, then click the show notes and I will put a link there that shows a video of what these tribal games actually looked like. I think it will be really fun because it's kind of almost like if you're reading a book as a kid, like Harry Potter, and then it comes out to a movie and then you're like, oh, this is what it looks like. You know, it's your imagination meeting the visual, uh, part of it whatever so yeah that's all i have thank you all for being here anything else that comes up before we head out i just want to thank you to you and tell you this was so much fun and also your dancing like you getting out there was it just blew me away i was like so impressed and i can only imagine like i i consider myself a somewhat decent dancer like i'm okay and i was terrified 
of the dance off. So the fact that like that was not something that you felt strong in and you got out there, it like you inspired the whole team. It was awesome. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so Sam. much for this. This was great. Yeah, just one last thing that really stuck with me that I think Charles talked about and Aubrey talked about to us is like that element of trust and like remembering who we trust and also that often like when you trust someone, they then become trustworthy. So I think it's, I don't know, it's like we're this aspect of control that we see out in the world is largely not trusting other people. So I think that was a big, just bigger theme in the world and in the summit was like, how can we trust more easily? And then those people will become trustworthy because we're not trying to control them. We're saying, you know, and I trust you to know. Absolutely. I, I love that quote. Thank you for bringing that up. Well, thank ladies, you, Sam. This was great. Thank you so much for taking the time and help me recap it because I couldn't do it alone. Um, it makes it so much easier for myself when we can kind of spitball and go back and forth. And thank you for showing up the way you ladies show up. This was a excellent episode. If I do say so myself, I think we touched on so many awesome things and I'm excited for people to hear it. And um, yeah, I have links to... Um, all the Lay's social media profiles in the show notes. So if you want to connect with them, it's super easy to connect with them. And if you have any questions at all, if there's anything that we missed or I missed putting in the show notes, feel free to reach out to me directly. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Sam.